I've come this afternoon to talk to you a little bit about the future. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about the future, mainly because uh, as a biomedical research scientist, that's my job. Also because, if you know me, I'm a bit of a dreamer. Um, but mainly because of my three kids. Now, if you look carefully and you're still awake, you see two kids. The third kid is due to arrive on Saturday, pretty much. So I've got my phone turned on, the volume's up full, and if it goes off, I'll jump about six feet into the air, so, so bear with me. So when thinking about the future, I consider the changes that I've seen on the planet during my own lifetime, right? So I'm 41 years old, and during my own lifetime, the population of the world has doubled. And that in itself is not so bad, really, when you think about it, but in that same time period, the amount of animal life on Earth has decreased by more than half. 52% less individual animals on the planet today than when I was born. That's appalling, right? We live in a world today in 2014 where people die of starvation, where there are two million people a year who die from not having access to clean drinking water. Not pharmaceuticals, not immunization, just water. I think that's appalling. So, then you start to think, as a scientist, you start to project forward. We like that. We like to extrapolate. We like to look at trends. By the time my kids are my age, there'll be 9 billion people on the planet. Half the kids in the Western world will live to be 100 years old. 100 years old. Think about that. Think about the challenges that that brings in terms of health care, in terms of ethical fashion, ethical food. How do we solve these problems? So by now, with my statistics and Ismail's story, you're probably thinking, Phew. But I think there's cause for hope. I think there's room for optimism. Because occasionally, human beings, we get it right. And we get it right when we combine our creativity, our ingenuity, but most of all, our cooperativity. And I'm going to give you some examples. So during my lifetime, we broke the ozone layer, and we fixed it. Isn't that great? Yeah? We wiped out CV, uh, CFCs from the planet, and the ozone layer is doubtlessly starting to fix itself. It's fantastic. In the last 30 years, we have eradicated smallpox, a horrible disease. We're also this close to eradicating polio. And we're bringing back iconic animals, like the blue whale, the largest creature that's ever been on our planet, from the brink of extinction to numbers that were about 50 years ago. It's fantastic. So it's amazing what we can do. How do we do that? Well, I think we do that when two things happen. First of all, we have educated, galvanized public opinion. And TED and social media are a fantastic, fantastic way to do that. The second thing we need, I believe, is great science. So TED, we all know. Science is what we're going to talk about for the remaining eight, nine minutes or so. So to think about this, I, uh, I reread a, a famous lecture by a Caltech physicist called Richard Feynman uh, about a year ago, and it made me think about this, because Feynman gave a very famous talk called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, where he talked about the enormous potential for miniaturization, right? What if we could shrink stuff down? What if we could write very small information? What if we could control matter at the micrometer or even nanometer length scale? And right now, many of you are texting away on your mobile phones, or you have a tablet or a laptop, which would be impossible without exactly the kind of technology that Feynman predicted. And even us here at DSM and other people around the world have found other ways to make technology very small. The bull you see on the left there is actually made out of a DSM material by a group in, uh, in Osaka, um, Tokyo, with lasers, right? writing 3D printing with lasers. And it's the size of a red blood cell. Isn't that amazing? A 3D model made with lasers the size of a red blood cell? The other thing that you see there on the right is our anti-reflective coating, which was part of the team that developed that, uh, where we have to control these pores and these holes at the nanometer level. So this coating is 1,000 times thinner than a human hair. And we have to control the structure within that tiny, tiny length scale. So I believe nanotechnology and microtechnology still have a lot to offer us, but I think the bottom, in Feynman's terms, is getting a little crowded. So I wonder, if Feynman was alive today, where would he think the opportunities are? Where do you think the space is? So I think I'd like to tackle that, looking at the three great sciences one at a time, and let's see if we can have a little bit of fun with that. Physics. Ah, old father physics. Now, the thing about physics is, ever since human beings have been looking at the objects of the night sky, tracking them, 
when they've been measuring and predicting natural cycles like the sun, the moon, and the tides, they have, in fact, been doing physics. Now, I like to give my physicist friends a bit of a hard time, right? Because, A, they're all smarter than me, and B, they should be further on. Why is it that when I go to California, I have to get on a horrible tin can for 12 hours? Where's the teleportation that you promised me when I was a kid? Where are the floating cars? You've had four and a half thousand years and a lot of money. Get a move on. The truth is that our understanding of the physical universe, especially the everyday, ordinary physical universe that we're surrounded in, not the exotic stuff, is exquisite. And then we do some really, really crazy physics, like here at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, where they're looking for what makes up the early universe. And the other question is, what is it with physicists in big circles? Chemistry. Ah, chemistry. My first love. I love chemistry. The thing about chemistry is nowadays we're capable of extracting, purifying, identifying, or simply designing any molecule we want. This, for example, is the word love written in amino acids. The message is we can make any molecule we can design, as long as it sticks to within certain laws of chemistry. But there's another side. If we're honest with ourselves, all of the useful or simple chemistry was done by the Germans about 100 years ago. Now, when I say useful or simple, I also mean incredibly powerful. This is nitrogen fixation. The core of the chemistry that led to fertilizers that allowed the population to double in my lifetime, that chemistry is 100 years old. What about biology? Well, biology is like the new kid on the block, right? Before Darwin, biology was basically a bunch of rich Victorian guys going around the world, shooting animals, recording them, and sticking them in formaldehyde and putting them in museums. It took a fairly great theory from a great man like Darwin to turn collection into science, right? A hundred years later, biology is going like a rocket. The things that we're capable of doing are incredible. We can clone animals. We can engineer biological pathways. We can make biomass into fuel and raw materials. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that while the individual sciences still obviously have a lot to contribute, they're either mature or they're maturing very quickly. And I believe there's as much, if not more, opportunity by combining them than simply by carrying on deepening them. So it's about combination, but it's also about a question of depth. So when we study science, when we first familiarize ourselves with a field, we have a broad view, yeah? but limited depth. We are basically practitioners. We could exercise that science. But then we start to specialize. Say you do a master's degree or a PhD. You start to go deeper. But as you go deeper, your field of view naturally narrows. Yeah? You know more about a narrower field. Eventually, you master a field absolutely and completely. Yeah? You're an expert. You know this thing better than anybody else. But your field of vision has become quite narrow. Now, what's true for an individual scientist is also true for a whole field. Because as chemistry gets more advanced, as physics gets more advanced in biology, there's just less of it. Now, if we think about that in these terms, and hopefully you'll see something. Oh, did that again. And that is that the amount of room between the sciences increases at depth. The deeper we go, the more room there is. And the problem is we have a tendency to communicate with each other at this top level, because that's comfortable. Let me give you an example of when it works very well. About two weeks ago, I was driving home from here, and I was listening to the BBC radio in my car, as I like to do, and I was still looking for my big example of how this works well. And I heard this story about a project combining cutting-edge uh, uh, particle physics with neuroscience. And I drove home, I thought, yes, I found my example. I got online, and within a week, I was having a video chat on Skype with these two wonderful people. Now, they were very passionate scientists, extraordinarily eloquent, and also very generous with their time. So let me tell you about their story. Giovanni is a particle physicist, so he likes nothing more than smashing small particles into other small particles at ridiculous speeds, right? And when he does that, he generates an enormous amount of data. 40 million collisions per second, they track every collision, and only every couple of minutes do they see new physics. Michaela is a neuroscientist, and she's interested in how we perceive our environment through vision, how we look at something, how the retina starts to 
process data and how the visual cortex takes all that information and crunches it down in real time to what we think is happening right now. So they get together and they have a project where they use an algorithm for managing, for modeling the way the brain and the retina function to crunching the, num the, num uh, the data at CERN. I thought, this is fantastic. So I asked them because of my talk, how did you start? How did this project come about? And they said, we're married. <laughs> yes. I said, yes. Oh, that's brilliant. I said, so why did you marry? Because you had um, similar interests. You know, you both, both your subjects are quite mathematical. No, we just met and fell in love, like people do. It took us 20 years of her coming to my conferences and me going to her conferences and talking over the dinner table to realize that what I had is what she needed and the other way around. Wow. So that's the project they have. It's a fantastic project, and I'm very grateful to them. Now, I said the room increases at depth. How do we facilitate more of this? Well, this is where it starts to get challenging, because we can't just have scientists marry each other, right? I mean, it's a good idea. I'm nothing against it, but it strikes me as a little bit random. What we need is we need another grouping of scientists, scientists whose job it is not to only be deep, but also be broad. They sit at this sort of intermediate layer. I call them skilled connectors. These are people who have both depth, but have depth in more than one subject. And how do you do that? Well, academia needs to train them. Companies like DSM need to hire them. But also, people need to want to be them. Young people need to want to jump from one discipline to another. And I think we need to help them in doing that. So before I wrap up, I'd like to say that I've tried to tell this story today using science as an example. But it doesn't have to be. It can be anything. I don't care if you're a physicist, a chemist, a biologist. I don't care if you're a social scientist. I don't care if you work in catering, photography, sound. What I care about is that if you have the curiosity to give up a couple of hours of your day to come to a TED Talk or access one in line, and you have the freedom to seriously consider the ideas that you find there, then you also have the responsibility to go deep, to connect, to discuss, to collaborate with others, to make the impossible possible, and to help to be a, paint a brighter future for all our kids. Oh, going the wrong way. <laughs> Thank you very much.